Today, I'd like to tell you why it's common for us to send texts to our friends and family or share images of the taxi license plates when we go home alone in the middle of the night or early morning hours. Every country has its own tales of serial killers except Hong Kong. Since 1945, when Japan was defeated and forced to leave Hong Kong, there had been no experience of serial killers until 1982. But everything changed for Hong Kong in 1982. Hi, my friends, Alexi from Criminal Report is here. And today I wanna to tell you a horrifying story about a real life serial killer. This video and its content may include disturbing scenes. So we advise that it is not suitable for the young age individuals. Today's video is about Hong Kong's first ever serial killer, Lam Kor Wan, known as the Jars Killer or the Rainy Night Murderer. On August 10, 1982, in British Hong Kong, police officer Lee Kwok Ho was in his office in Kuantong. Tong. Every time there was a murder case, he had to go to the crime scene. Even though his job was not pleasant at all, he enjoys his job because he feels he is contributing to the safety of Hong Kong. Every time he read about Hong Kong's safety measures in the international news, he was thankful that they didn't have serial killers, like in other countries around the world. Till that day, and at around three o'clock, his phone rang. The person on the other end, introduce himself as the manager of a Kodak shop in Sim Sha Tui named Wang Tai Yin. Kodak, the iconic photography company, was known for capturing memories on film and printing stunning pictures. Wang was telling Officer Lee one of his regular customers had recently came into his shop, but was behaving very strangely this time. His customer told him, I am a university lab technician who sometimes takes photos of the deceased in the hospital morgue as a part of my medical research, and now, he wants to print them. Since he mentioned taking pictures of the autopsy of dead bodies, Wong knew to expect unpleasant and bloody photos. For this reason, at the beginning, he did not think anything was strange. So he accepted the job and received money for printing them. Wong received the negatives personally and printed them himself because he didn't want other staff to handle those kinds of photos. So Wong informed this customer the prints would be ready in a few days. However, before the pictures were ready, this customer visited the shop three times to check on the status of printing and also made some new requests. On the fourth visit, he asked Wong to print one of his pictures in a larger size. Wong told him in this branch, they do not have the facility to print large photos. However, he provided an address and suggested to him to go to another branch where they can print photos in any size. Wong also mentioned they can inform the other branch about the customer's request and they will do it ASAP. Around one hour after Wong was sent the guy to the other branch, the manager of that branch called him. He was so frightened that he could not even speak on the line. Wang tried to calm him down and asked him to explain what had happened, promising to help him once he had calmed down. The manager of another shop told Wang. He enlarged the photos, but later realized they were not taken from the hospital morgue. He believes that the morgue photographs should be taken on a hospital table in a designated room labeled accordingly, rather than in a bedroom. He said he is convinced these photos are memories of a serial killer. Officer Lee listened carefully to everything that Wang told him. From the moment he hung up the phone, he knew his life was about to change forever. Wang told Lee he believed all the pictures belonged to one person, but Lee remained doubtful. So Officer Lee started his investigation to determine how many murders or missing person cases had occurred in Hong Kong over the past few years, which he or his colleagues had not been able to solve. He hoped to connect these cases to see if they were related in any way. He had a gut feeling that it was impossible for this person to be responsible for only one murder. As expected, he found a case that he believed could be related to the same person. A few months ago, the Hong Kong police discovered fragments of a woman's body in the Xingmen River. At this point, his idea was, Hong Kong finds its first serial killer. He informed higher police authorities, but they had no clues. The only lead was, the killer was a customer of a Kodak shop in Sim Sha Tsui. The manager of the shop did not know the name, age, or the address of the person in question. They were only able to describe his face. Even the police who were patrolling the streets were unable to locate him, as there are between 100 to 150,000 people living in each street of Hong Kong. The police's only hope was that the person in question would go to the Kodak shop to collect his photos. On August 17, 1982, two groups of plainclothes officers under Lee's LED took over the shop area and waited for the signal from the Kodak shop manager to arrest the person in question once he arrived to pick up his photos. They waited outside and watched the area carefully until a taxi stopped in front of the shop. At that exact moment, the shop staff signaled to the police when the person entered the shop. The police took immediate action and arrested him. Once he was arrested, he started to scream and defend himself, perhaps in an attempt to rescue himself from the police. 
However, they successfully put him in the police car and brought him to the police station. When confronted, he claimed that the photographs belonged to a friend of his who worked on a boat, and he was just helping him out. Officer Lee then suggested to him that if the photos did not belong to him, they could go together to give them to the friend. Once the friend showed up, they could then arrest him and he would be free to go. A team of police accompanied a man to a place where he claimed he would meet his friend. They secured the entire area and waited for his friend for about two hours. However, no one showed up and they concluded that there was no person as he had claimed. Consequently, they arrested him. The name of the person that the police arrested was Lam Korwan. The police began searching the suspect's taxi to look for any evidence that may incriminate him. During the search, they discovered a knife and handcuffs in the vehicle. Despite this, the suspect maintained his innocence and claimed that he could provide an explanation for the items found in the taxi. As a result, the police had to work diligently on the case because if they were unable to gather sufficient evidence, they would have to release the suspect within two days. The officers took Lam Korwan to the police station while a homicide investigation team went to his house, which shocked his family. They searched his apartment in Tukwawan Kowloon to find evidence. In his small room, they found many books and expensive photography tools, which was strange since he was just a taxi driver and not a professional photographer or cinematographer. They continued searching until they stumbled upon a locked metal box hidden under his bed. Detectives immediately recognized the box since they had seen it in pictures that Lam Kor Wan had printed. At that moment, they were sure that Lam Kor Wan had used this room to take photos of his victims. They opened the box with no idea what to expect. Inside, they discovered photographs taken by Lam Kor Wan, showing himself with the bodies after their death. He went as far as documenting the dismemberment of the victims, with over a thousand pictures recovered. Alongside these, there were videos, books on human anatomy, a red woman's bag, high-heeled shoes, and surgical tools. But what shocked the detectives even more were numerous jars containing women's sexual organs. The detectives were super shocked by what they had found so far. At first, the police thought the father and younger brother of Lam, who were living with him in the same apartment, might be involved in the killings, because it seemed too much for just one person to do all those cruel acts in a share house. So on August 17, 1982, they arrested his father and younger brother. After a thorough investigation and when Lam Kor Wan admitted to the murders, they were released. So go back to what detectives found in the Lam Kor Wan's apartments. Because the police needed strong proof for the court, they formed a team of experts to carefully go through all the evidence, analyzing photos and videos. In one video, they saw him with a body in different stages of dismemberment, and he was smiling. Now the police had to figure out who these women were and where the rest of their bodies might be. To prove in court that he was guilty, they had to make him confess. They tried different ways, but nothing worked until Officer Lee found a way. He realized that Lam Kor Wan's weakness was appearing in the media and looking suspicious for the crimes. So in one questioning session, Officer Lee told Lam that if he doesn't confess, they were going to make his case public to gather more evidence against him. In the end, Lam Kor Wan confessed to all his crimes, but he had a condition. The photos and videos would never be made public. So who is Lam Kor Wan? Lam was born in British Hong Kong on May 22, 1955, named Lam Kwok Yue. Lam's family was big, his dad had three wives and ten kids, and they all lived in the same apartment. Lam, being the oldest son, had a lot of responsibilities. Between 1957 and 1962, Lam's dad worked in an oil company in Brunei. When they returned to Hong Kong in December 1962, they moved to Kuantong. Lam Kor Wan had a hard childhood. His dad was super strict, like an army sergeant, with many rules. Lam had to do everything perfectly to make his dad happy, or he'd face physical punishment. Lam attended a government elementary school and was usually in the top 10 students. In 1970, his dad opened a motorcycle store and Lam's grades went down as he helped after school. This affected his relationship with his dad, who often scolded him for his grads. After finishing high school, Lam decided to continue his studies. So at first, he worked in his dad's store and later as an apprentice for a relative in air conditioning. At this moment, the dark side of his personality started to take shape. Growing up as a teen, he purchased a Polaroid camera and began intruding into women's bathrooms. This happened in the early 1970s, when public toilets in Hong Kong were simple, just holes in the ground. Lam would discreetly capture photos under the cabin doors and hastily make his escape. In 1973, when Lam was 18 years old, after an argument with his father, he got expelled from his home. The argument with his father left him feeling humiliated and out of control. Making matters worse, he also felt like he had lost his sense of masculinity. 
Alone in a dark street with nowhere to go, he decided to reclaim his lost sense of masculinity. After one hour of walking in the street, he later said to police he had no idea how he arrived in that area with that knife in his hand. He got arrested for threatening a woman with a knife and touching her lower body in a public toilet on Hock Yuen Street, Hung Hom. Given his youth and lack of a criminal record, authorities opted for a rehabilitative approach. Lam was sent to Castle Peak Psychiatric Hospital, where he spent 102 days receiving treatment. When Lam was about 19 years old, he and his family noticed he was behaving abnormally and was interested in female flesh. Until that age, he collected dozens of adult magazines. He was later caught peeping at his sister's naked body outside the toilet of his residence in Kun Tong. He was kicked out of the house again, but this time his dad and younger brother joined him to live in a new apartment together. In 1978, Lam obtained a cab license and changed his name to Lam Korwan after he officially became a cab driver. And in about 1980, he became a nighttime cab driver. For his new working time, he could roughly see his brother and father. In 1981, he suddenly became interested in photography and began to study photography techniques. He joined a photography club and of course started to buy a lot of expensive photography equipment. On February 3, 1982, at 4 a.m., he was driving his taxi in the Tsim Sha Tsui district, which had many clubs and bars around four in the morning looking for passengers who needed a ride home after a night out in that rainy night. He said to police, he had an electric cable in his car and already decided to commit his first murder, but he was still not 100% certain until a woman clearly drunk came out of the restaurant and hailed him. Even though other drivers had refused to take her, Lam decided to help and took her in his taxi. Her name was Chan Feng Lan, and she was a hostess and dancer in Chinese Palace nightclub in Sim Sha Tsui. During the ride, she asked him to stop at a gas station because she needed to vomit. But suddenly she closed the door and changed her mind and asked Lam to go back the other way. She was very confused and didn't know where she was. And then suddenly she vomited in his car. And this made him really mad and disgusted. Lam said at first he hesitated to kill her, but suddenly something inside him clicked. He entered a garage, went around to the passenger door, and using an electric cable, strangled the young woman. He drove home and parked as usual in front of the building. It was five in the morning, the time he usually finished work. The street was deserted. He hid the body in a large bag and then carried it to his apartment. So he entered the apartment as silently as he could to not woke up his father and brother and hid the body under the sofa, and he went to sleep. In the morning, when his brother and father left the apartment, he got up and started preparing his room for taking photo of Feng Lang's Nikkei body. After taking a photo of her, he covered the floor with plastic, making sure even the baseboards were protected. Then using an electric saw, he began cutting up the body. He was very careful, but it was impossible for him to avoid a little blood splattering on the walls. It took him several hours to cut up the corpse, and he took photographs during the process. When he was finished, he packed her body in seven separate packages, but kept her breath and sexual organs. Then he cleaned up the walls and floor. He had to make several trips to carry all the body parts to his taxi. No one paid attention to the small packages he placed in his trunk. He found a deserted place on the banks of the Xing Mun River, near Sha Tin. Making sure no one saw him, he took the packages out of his trunk one after the other and threw them into the river. Less than a week, her arm had been found on the Xing Mun River. The next day, a pair of legs were discovered, and soon after, the rest of the body was discovered. The police tried to identify her based on a tattoo on one of her arms, which was rare for a woman at the time. By publishing a photo in the newspapers and searching through missing persons files, the police identified the body of Chan Feng Lan, whom her husband had been searching for for a week. Lam Korwan's first killing happened by chance, but his second one was carefully thought out. He was a perfectionist and aimed to be more prepared. Instead of using a basic electric saw, he sought professional tools and visited a surgical supply store. There, he carefully examined knives, blades, and scissors, ultimately buying specialized surgical instruments and several bottles of formaldehyde. Then he bought a book till he learned all about the human body. So just four months after his first murder, on May 29, 1982, three days after purchasing his equipment, Lam was killed again. At 5.20, trade cashier Chan Wankit, who was 31 years old, took a taxi outside Wusung Street from work on a rainy night. Once she got in the cab, Lam Kor Wan locked all the doors. Then he strangled Chan Wan Kit with an electric cable, then took her home. As with his first victim, he stayed in his bed while waiting for his family to leave for work and then began cutting up the body. But this time, Lam cut up the body with meticulous care. When the body was discovered and autopsied, the medical examiner noticed this surgical skill. The incisions were so precise that it seemed the killer was a professional. 
He had thought long and hard about where to dump the body, and after several excursions in the middle of the night, he had found the perfect spot. The location he had in mind was a heavily wooded residential, 20-minute drive east of downtown on Tai Hang Road. He threw the body into a muddy ravine. In the days that followed, Lam constantly thought about the events of that night to understand how to improve himself. Till two weeks later, he struck again. On 17 June 1982, on a rainy night around 4 a.m., a 29-year-old street cleaner, Lung Sao Wan, got off work. In the beginning, everything was normal. But after a few minutes, Lam Kor Wan stopped the car and first tried to assault her sexually. But she did not allow that to happen. So he strangled her with an electric cable and took her back to his room as he had done with the first two. But this time, he even cut her abdomen of Leung, picked out the intestines and put them in his mouth to taste. Lam Kor Wan had the craving to taste human flesh, but finally gave up because he felt sick. Then he wrapped the body in a large bag of rice and returned to Tai Hang Road to dispose of it. As Lam Kor Wan committed more murders, he became more daring, taking time to plan his next crimes meticulously. Familiar with the bars in Sim Shatui, he targeted places where women frequently waited alone for taxis. His initial victims were labeled as bad girls. But for his next crime, he intentionally selected a young woman from a higher social class, seeking someone he perceived as innocent. On July 2, 1982, 17-years-old Leung Wai Sum was waiting for a taxi after attending a high school thank you party at the Sheraton Hotel in Sim Sha Tsui. She decided to leave after the meal at 11 p.m. Lam Kor Wan drove her to a quiet, secluded road and parked. At first, she was terrified when he grabbed her wrists and handcuffed her, but he kept asking her questions about her family and her life. As she got calm again, and Wai Sum fell asleep around 4 in the morning, Lam Kor Wan actually enjoyed her company but it wasn't enough to hinder his nasty plan. When she fell asleep, Lam Kor Wan strangled her with an electric cable. He then took her home and waited as usual for her family to leave the apartment. Then he attached his video camera to a high shelf and recorded what he did next. The video shows him having sexual intercourse with the body of Wai Sung. Lam was a virgin, and this was his first sexual experience. That is why he wanted to print the photo of Wai Sung later on in the Kodak shop. He then cut the body into pieces as he had done with previous victims and left the body on Tai Hang Road. After his confession, police tried to find the bodies of all the victims. On 21st August 1982, three days after he got arrested, they started to search for the bodies. On March 3rd, 1983, his trial officially started. When Lam Kor Wan went to trial for his crimes, Hong Kong officials considered the details too disturbing and upsetting for women to hear, so only men were allowed to serve on the jury. In his trial, he said, I am innocent. I am killing upon God's request, and I am the rainy night murderer. But all the jury knew he was speaking to look mad to get out of the death penalty. But in any case, they had to confirm his mental health. So they formed a team of five expert psychologists to confirm his mental health. In April 1983, a jury of seven men found Lam Kor Wan guilty of four counts of murder, and he received a death sentence by hanging. However, in 1993, Hong Kong abolished the death sentence. And so Lam Kor Wan, who is now 67, is still alive and serving a life sentence in Shek Pik Prison. He has no friends in the jail, and he is not speaking with anyone about his crimes. And this is what makes him different from other killers. In the prison, he just reads books and magazines. In these 39 years, not one of his family members visited him. However, his father built a memorial center for his victims, and he tried to support their families as much as he could. His father tried to sell their flat and move out, but no one wanted to buy it because of the high-profile cases. So the Lamb family had to stay in the place where the crimes happened for the rest of their life. Okay, my friends, this was Complete Story of the Jars Murderer. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much for sticking around until the end of the video. If you found it valuable, please consider giving it a thumbs up and hitting the subscribe button to support us. Your support means a lot. Until the next story, take care, stay safe, and steer clear of any problems.